this university, of course, was Natal, was David, or Methamela, and the executive director of the Mazisi Gunene Foundation, Mrs. Mata Nene, and the veterans that are here tonight were mentioned, Ms. Meg Maharaj, Ms. Mabuso, Simon, Dr. Al Albertina, Albertina Lutuli, Poets, Isnyosi, and our distinguished guests who are brought together by a love of the creative arts. And I also recognize Mr. Umim Nguni and Mr. Ngovo from the Department of Arts and Culture in the province. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very privileged indeed to speak this evening as we open the 20th edition of the Poetry of Africa International Festival. Over the next five days, the Elizabeth Snedden Theatre will become a center of creativity and inspiration as outstanding poets from around the world present their gifts. For aspiring poets, this is the highlight of the year. The festival brings, as we have heard, with it opportunities for exposure through open mix and competitions. It brings the chance of learning from the masters who are here tonight through workshops and seminars and of having the creative spark ignited by performances and readings. I would like to salute another freedom fighter, Dr. John Matera, also, also who is a freedom fighter in his own right. I believe that we will come away from this festival, di different people will not be the same. Yes. Having acquired a new perspective and a fresh vision, because it is impossible to listen to poetry of such a high standard and not be changed. Good poetry makes you think. A good poetry makes you feel. It engages your sense and plays your mind. It gets into those places where thoughts have become stale, challenging new seeds to germinate. At a time like this, when the focus of our university is tragically mired in protest, violence, and destruction, there is a very great need for an injection of constructive creativity. I'm therefore grateful to the Center for Creative Arts at the University of Kosovo Natal for forging ahead with the festival in a time of academic evil, we must remind ourselves of the noble side of higher learning. <clears throat> the present fight is not just a fight for free education, it is a fight to open the door to knowledge to anyone with the desire and capacity to walk through it. Anyway. Anyway, Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I did say, just say capacity. Let me say something controversial. <laughs> Not everyone is suited for higher education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The person of knowledge takes us. It takes self-sacrifice, perseverance, and hard work. Getting into university is just the first step. From there, it's up to the individual to use every resource at their disposal to assimilate information from lectures to books to online tutorials, newspapers, journals, and debates. Knowledge is not an object passively passed from lecturer to student. It is alive and constantly evolving. It demands to be pursued not once, but continually. <laughs> I'm concerned that something is being lost in the present upheaval. Students are pitting themselves against university leadership in a way that creates antagonism towards lecturers. By default, lecturers find themselves on the defensive. This changes the relationship between lecturer and student, dissolving the traditional notion of mentor 
an apprentice. In a pressure society, that could be beneficial. But in a young democracy like ours, I fear something valuable may in fact be lost. A generation ago, our youth were urged by their political leaders to destroy schools and abandon classrooms as a means of protest. Storming of police was applauded, and those who challenged authority were lionized. When we entered democracy, the former freedom fighters became administrators. They expected their authority to be respected because it was bestowed by democracy. Now, the difficulty is that once a culture of respect is dead, it is almost impossible to revive it. This generation has been built on the promises of freedom, opportunity, and gain. The foundation of respect for authority, discipline, and responsibility is weak by comparison. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a simple truth about the present moment in the timeline of South African history. But because of this, when students start to see their lecturers as an enemy, a fundamental element of education is lost, a fundamental of respect. Now, this poses an obstacle to the transfer of knowledge. <coughs> if Aristotle had sat under the teaching of Plato and felt no respect for his teacher's wisdom and experience, we would probably not know the name Aristotle. Wow, wow, wow. Now, because to become great in one's chosen field, the student must learn everything the teacher knows and then build on it, surpass it even, or challenge it. This is the formula of intellectual progress. It is the way societies move forward and individuals change history. If you have no respect for your lecturer, the inclination to learn what they know will of course vanish. Now, I imagine that Mr. Mashamela is thinking I've gone off on a tangent. For well, I'm supposed to be opening a poetry festival. <clears throat> but, ladies and gentlemen, I felt that these things needed to be said, particularly in the presence of open minds. <laughs> because this room is filled with thinkers and thought leaders. I had to take advantage of the opportunity because if people like you start thinking and talking about a return to respect, many will be influenced. Poetry influences people, it influences societies, and shapes the way people interact with their environment. It is both a reflection of a reality and a creator of reality. In my own life, poetry has certainly had a strong influence. I was raised with music as my constant companion for my mother, Princess Makoko Vatinizu, was an accomplished composer and singer. There was always a song on her lips. I went to sleep in the rhythmic meter of choral hymns and walked to the sung stories of my ancestors. The Zulus that are present here tonight will know about Bulala, that after a wedding, then there is Ubulana, that's where the groom's people and the bridegroom's and the, and, the, and the bride's people together sit together. And the bride's people uh, tell the new in-laws if there are any ailments uh, or any problems about their daughter. It is said that in the case of my mother, it was said that because by tradition, a young bride cannot sing. It was told that her, ma her malady was singing and that she should be excused because she can't <laughs> still sing. <laughs> and she was also a poet in her own right because she could recite the praises of her ancestors from Sansa Makona right through up to her two brothers, King Solomon and Prince Michiel. Mm -hmm. An appreciation of words, timing and artistic beauty is thus part of my personality. Being raised in the palace of my uncle, Kotla Mashaj, I benefited from the oral tradition of Zulu culture, hearing again and again about the significant moments of our past. 
I learned not only about Isandwana and my great grandfather's regiments, King Kejuayu, but also how a turn of phrase can add nuance to a story and change the familiar into something exciting and something new. I think every poet from every culture undertakes a journey of discovery before finding their own voice. Consider how we learn phonetic rhyming in primary school, matching the cat with Matt, with the mat, and the house with the mouse. <laughs> Later, we admire the rhythmic couplet that ends every Shakespearean sonnet. So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lies this, and this gives life to thee. But then we pick up a book by E. E. Cummings, and all the rules of punctuation and sentence structure fly out of the window. <laughs> Suddenly, spring can be described as Mark Lucius and Paddy Wonderful. These are important milestones on the journeys of discovery. We need to eat a diverse feast before we can know our own taste. Oh, wow. Similarly, <laughs> so we're all feasting here this week. <laughs> Similarly, the more ingredients we have in our kitchen, the more adventurous we can be with our cooking. I'm therefore delighted that this festival brings a diverse group of poets onto one stage, showcasing some of the best artistic talent of the present. Aspiring and imagined poets will be exposed to a rich variety from which to draw inspiration. I particularly admire the initiative of extending the festival into our schools by taking poets to visit learners. I know from my own experience that when a love of poetry blossoms in a child's heart, it finds a permanent home. <laughs> so I thank the University of Kosovo Natal for introducing poets and poetry to the community. You are bringing the written word to life for many young people. That is a very valuable gift. As in Kosi, I place a high value on our cultural inheritance. I understand that the next generation needs more than houses and jobs. They need a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. They need to know where they come from. They need to understand their place in the greater whole so that they will value themselves and others. I must congratulate in your CSE, Mr. Buzacheni Mjaeche, who I believe will be honored tonight. Buzacheni comes from a Sabatini where I come from. I knew his father. My mother is telling me about his grandfather, who was one of King Dinsel's warriors who fought in the Civil War between Usuji and Mandagazi. He and Dr. Don Matera are indeed living legends. And it's right that we honor them. And I want to thank Mazis Munene Foundation, the Living Legends Trust, and the Department of Arts and Culture for birthing the Mazis Munene Poetry Award so that our living legends can be supported and recognized. It is vital that we enable them to pass on their knowledge and to keep doing what they do so well. This is also a wonderful way to honor the late Professor Mazisi Gunelli, a freedom fighter in his own right. South Africa's first poet laureate, who performed an invaluable service to our nation by showing the world the beauty of Isisu. He is one of the great protectors of our cultural heritage as the tenth commemoration of his passing coincides with the centenary of the Zulu nation. It is significant that his magnus opus, Uno Dumeshe's Gamez, Emperor Shara the Great, will soon be published for the first time in his original Sisu. I'm honored and privileged to have known Professor Munene and to have called him a friend and a brother. He and his wife, who is here tonight, Mrs. Machabo Nene, received my wife and I very warmly while they were living in exile in London and California 
where Professor Gnani was teaching Shizu. I was astonished when he gave me a copy of Emperor Shaba the Great in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> that showed the extent to which his work was admired throughout the world. I don't know anyone who has contributed more to Shizu literature than Professor Gnani. Even now, I'm sure that I'll get a, a, you know, a dressing up for my sister. Unfortunately, I'm sitting next to her. Yeah. Even now, I'm sitting, now the, there are stacks of his unpublished works at the Mazisib Nere Museum. It is incredible to think of such a treasure trove right here in Durban. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a great power in the spoken word. Poetry is meant to be spoken. Only then can the listener be transported to the world of the poet. Dr. Don Matera, whom I've known for many decades, I, I think, I hope that he has entered the privileged uh, club of octogenarians. <laughs> <laughs> he explained this beautifully when he wrote about his grandfather in memory is the weapon. So I'll just close with Dr. Matera's words. Sometimes he reminisced about his country and his people and their history of war and peace. But so thick like a swelling river flowed the music of his land in his veins that when he sang, a lamp instantly came to his throat. I traced tears of longing and nostalgia in his half-blind eyes. Through them I virtually lived in the farm cottage in his native Italy, and walked among the olive trees eating as I sang. It was my feet that crushed the grapes to make wine, my hand that ground the wheat and harvested potatoes. Even my blood was shed in the long vendettas. I became one of them who I had never seen or touched or spoken to. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of poetry, I think.